Is it working? Is it pointing at me? Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Like to, uh, it's 9 o'clock. We're going to get rolling uh, right here at the beginning. I'm sure other people will be trickling in. Um, you should have in front of you a set of notes for uh, Lesson 59, which is titled Introduction to Canonical Models. Okay? Introduction to Canonical Models. If you were to open up to Ezekiel 40, chapter 40 to start with, so um, last Sunday we started talking about this issue of the concept of canonicity. And by canonicity, again, we're referring to the, the boundaries of the Scripture. So which books should be in the Scripture versus which books should not, should, should have been lift, left out, this kind of thing. And last Sunday we did a, um, an introduction to that. Some of you were here, some of you weren't. Those of you that weren't, I think I was able to give you the notes. I know Craig and, and Sarah have already... Uh, watched it. But uh, we're going to get rolling today. We're going to continue. We're going to be looking at the issue of canonicity for a number of weeks. Um, this is an important issue that frankly gets overlooked, I think, a lot by people um, in their study of the issue of the scripture and so forth. A lot of people aren't really, um, there's some issues here that they don't really know how to answer and, and talk about in a real informative sort of way. So I do want to spend some time on this. Ezekiel chapter 40, verse 2. No, I'm sorry, verse 3. We started off by talking last week about scriptural foundation for belief in a canon. And we looked at verses in the Old Testament. We looked at verses in the New Testament that talked about uh, the measuring read, the rule, that the, the standard by which things are going to be judged, and that this, this concept is internal to the scriptures themselves. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. And he brought me thither, and behold, there was a man... Uh, whose appearance was like, uh, was like the appearance of brass, with a line of flax in his hand and a measuring reed, and he stood in the gate. And so we looked at passages in, in, in chapter 41 and chapter 42, talking about the measuring reed and how it was used in a building process and, and, and all of that, and tried to establish the idea that's internal to the Scriptures, that there should be some standard their standard unit of measures, and the same thing would apply to the Scriptures themselves. So we went over all of that last Sunday. We talked about the New Testament canon. And by the way, I don't remember who asked the question. I think it was you, Fred. Did you ask the question about where the minor prophets were on that chart? Okay, I did look at that. I said I was going to look at that. I did look at that, and I had accidentally left them off. Okay. So I added them back in in that center column. That's where, that's where they belonged uh, in that particular table. So I added them back in. The most updated copy of the notes that's available on the internet has that inserted back in there. So um, that was a good catch. I, I had not noticed that when I was putting them together. So today, Lesson 59 is Introduction to Canonical, canonical Models. And the first topic I want to talk a little bit about is something that I've titled Canonical Insecurities. Okay, Now, you might not have any of these insecurities, but there are plenty of Christians who are very insecure about this topic for a variety of reasons that I want to try to at least discuss a little bit here. Okay, So point number one. The question of canonicity endure, endures as one, as, as one of the perennial questions faced by any believer living in our current postmodern age. <clears throat> Popular books such as Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code call into question whether the church has accurately identified what books should be in the New Testament. So, I don't have, are, how many of you are familiar with the Da Vinci Code? I've heard of it. The Da Vinci Code was a novel, it was written in the early 2000s. Very, very popular book, swept the whole world, and was ultimately turned into a movie. And what what's, the Da Vinci Code discusses, it, it's, a, it's a long, involved story. It's like a thriller. There's a lot of things happening in the Da Vinci Code. But one of the key things as it relates to the canon is the idea that the Catholic Church, the, the sexist Catholic Church, determined the scripture and set the bounds of the canon as a way of oppressing people. And if this hadn't have happened, then Christianity, as we know, would have been totally different, and the canon would have been totally different. So this is an idea that Dan Brown talks about in the book, okay? And this caused a lot of, a lot of fuss for a lot of Christians, and still does, frankly, as a result of this book. Now, what Dan Brown did, in, in he didn't get that idea on his own. He, there was a whole discussion of canonicity that was occurring, 
that he picked up on and inserted into the book. And once it made its way into this piece of popular culture, it really swept through uh, certain segments even of the church where there was a lot of questions then about like what, um, you know, what are the boundaries of the canon and, 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 these, and these kinds of things. Okay? So one of the more scholarly, one, excuse me, on the more scholarly side, German author D.F. Strauss has called the issue of canonicity the Achilles heel of Protestant Christianity. Okay? So the, the idea that there would be um, this, you, you all know what an Achilles heel is, right? You know the story of Achilles? How many of you know the story of Achilles? His mom dipped him in the river Styx and he held him by his heels and so the only place he could be killed is if he got, if he got hit in the heels, right? So um, the, this guy is saying that canonicity is the Achilles, heels, uh, Achilles heel of Protestant Christianity. Meanwhile, Herman uh, Ryderbos views the problem of canonicity as, quote, the hidden dangling illness of the church. So there are a lot of people that are unsettled about this. How do we know? So the fundamental question is basically, how do we know that the New Testament should have 27 books and not 26 or 28 or some other number? How do we know that the 27 that we have in our Bible right now is the, is the 27 that we should have and that we shouldn't have 26, 28 or some other number altogether? Okay? Michael Kruger author of Can uh, Canon Revisited, Establishing the Origins and Authority of the New Testament Books, points out that these sorts of questions are to be expected when one considers the unique origins of the New Testament. So I, this, this book, I've had this book for a number of years, and this summer I finally got around to reading it, and it is an excellent book on this particular topic. Okay, A lot of the material that I'm going to be covering with you here in the next number of weeks on the issue of the canon is coming from different things that he says in the book Canon Revisited. But he says, of course, if you look at the quote, <clears throat> of course such a question should, uh, would not be asked if the New Testament were like most other books formed more or less all at the same time in the same place by a single author. Instead, with the boundaries of the New Testament, we are faced with a rather complex array of different books, authors, geographical settings, theological perspectives, and historical contexts that are all brought together into one unified volume. What do all these books share in common? What was the process by which they were brought together? And why should the result of that process be considered normative for the modern church? So, you understand the issue, right? The, the, the New Testament is not like this guy's book. This guy sits down at a computer, he writes it, he's responsible for it, it's all basically coming together through his, you know, his mind and his effort and, and so forth, and there's no question about where it came from or who wrote it or what have you, right? The New Testament is not like that. You have multiple different authors writing in from different geographical settings, different times, different places, talking you know, about a, a wide variety of different things, okay? And the idea of that those things would then somehow be gathered together into, a, into an authoritative collection is an idea that some people have a problem with, okay? Now, I don't want to give you the wrong impression. I don't have a problem with this idea at all, okay? But you're going to encounter people, you might even count people that um, consider themselves church-going and even Christian who might have questions about these issues. Okay? So questions regarding the canon are, a foundational, are of foundational significance regarding the sorts of questions being asked by skeptics and critics in our day. Quote, if Christians cannot adequately answer these questions about the canonical boundaries of the New Testament, then on what ground could they ever appeal to the content of the New Testament? Certainly there can be no New Testament theology if there's no such thing as a New Testament in the first place. So understand, critics of Christianity are seizing upon this and they're pounding on it as a mechanism to try to overthrow Christians' faith in the New Testament and trying to present doubt and insecurity into the mix about whether or not we really know for sure that we have everything that we need to have to have an authoritative message from God. And this is, uh, this is something that is going on a lot in our day. Consequently, the question of the canon is at the heart of how biblical authority is established. 
Critics of biblical Christianity have long recognized the significance of the canon question and have therefore focused much of their scholarly energies on that very issue. For example, Bart Ehrman declares the canon to be an invention of the dominant Christian factions of early Christianity designed to suppress or oppress other factions within the church with different theological convictions. So, he, Ehrman is a textual scholar. He's writing this highbrow book up here called Lost Christianities, where he's talking about all this stuff. And then what happens is that Dan Brown comes along and he takes this sort of highbrow, intellectual, philosophical debate about the canon and he, he writes it into his popular culture book, The Da Vinci Code. Millions of people read The Da Vinci Code and as a result, now all of a sudden there's all this doubt about what the New Testament canon should be. But Ehrman basically says that the 27 books that we have, we only have them essentially by accident because the winners determined what it should be. And there were all sorts of different Christianities, plural, out there in the first, second, and third century that all had their own lists of what books or what books were authoritative. And the only reason we have the ones that we do is because those guys happened to win. And as a result, they got to determine the list that was authoritative. Okay? That is essentially what he's saying. Kruger outlines two reasons why canonical studies continue to be a point of contention between believers and critics. I think that should say three reasons, because there's three reasons on the next page. So that would probably need to be changed. <laughs> first, so the first reason. Modern critical scholarship has continued to raise doubt about the authorship and date of numerous New Testament books, attributing many of them to later uh, pseudonymous authors. Um, not only are the traditional authors of the canonical Gospels rejected, but the Pauline letters of Colossians, Ephesians, and the pastoral epistles <coughs> are deemed to be inauthentic, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> along with books like 2 Peter, Jude, and others. Okay? So this is that critical approach to Scripture that is now saying, look, Mark didn't really write Mark. Luke didn't really write Luke. Matthew didn't really write Matthew. These are all written by all these other people, you know, under uh, synonymous and pseudonyms and this kind of a thing. Paul didn't really write Colossians and Ephesians. And they're just questioning everything and trying to throw um, the boundaries of the New Testament into doubt. Second... The last century and a half have been filled with sensational discoveries of apocryphal materials that have raised new questions about which books should be included in the canon. So here are a few examples. I've inserted this to give you an example of what we're talking about. The Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Thomas, the secret Gospel of Mark, and the Gospel of Judas, to name a few. So these literally, in the last 150 years, they've discovered manuscript copies of these writings. And then this has, of course, generated a whole lot of conversation about, well, should these also be in the Bible? Okay, is kind of the concept or the line of thought that some people have um, developed as a result of these discoveries. Okay, so if you look at the second half of that quote. Such discoveries have spurred all sorts of publications with provocative titles that raise questions about the state of the canon. For example, the five lost Gospels. So, should we have nine Gospels instead of four? Okay. The or lost scriptures and forgotten scriptures. These are ty different titles of books that are out there that are talking about these new discoveries of Gospel of Thomas and, and those kinds of writings, and then bringing up, well, why aren't these in the canon? And should we open the canon back up? Should we allow these things to be a part of the canon? All of that is coming as a result of some of these um, discoveries. And then third, third, the continued influence of Walter Bauer's book, Orthodoxy and Heresy, in Earliest Christianity. We need to make that italics, um, Sylvia. Can you make a note of that, please? Mm -hmm. The continued influence of Walter Bauer's book, Orthodoxy and Heresy in Earliest Christianity, this was written in 1934, has kept the canonical issue open. 
Bauer argued that early Christianity was originally very diverse and varied with no clear orthodox or heretical camp. Okay? What would later be called orthodoxy was simply the beliefs of one group that triumphed over the others. Thus, the books of the New Testament canon are simply the books of the winners of the early church power struggles, but do not necessarily represent, quote, original Christianity and should not be considered normative for Christians. Okay? So this is the kind of stuff that when you look at canonical studies, you're going to encounter this kind of thing. Okay? These types of criticisms of the notion of the canon and can we really know for sure and, and these, these kinds of uh, questions. Does anybody have any questions or comments before we move on to the next point? Okay, according to Bauer's thesis, now this is important. According to Bauer's thesis, apocryphal books have just as much validity as any other Christian book. Okay? So where's he getting that from? He's getting that from the idea that the winners decided. And, you know, notice, notice the similarities here between needing to, wanting to find the original autographs and reconstructing the original autographs and figuring out what was the original Christianity. And if we just knew what the original Christians believed, then we would, we would be able to know for sure that we had an accurate canon. This is the idea that these critics are putting forth, right? And of course, they know... Well, first of all, I don't buy that at all because I have Paul's epistles and I know what the original Christianity was, <laughs> okay? It was the formation of the church, the body of Christ. It was the revelation of the mystery. We understand these things from a doctrinal standpoint. So it's, it's not in doubt for me. But if you're starting off with the premise that you don't fundamentally believe and trust the Bible, then you've got to have reasons for why you can't do that. Okay, And these are some of the reasons that they are putting forth uh, along those lines. Okay, So the challenges to canonicity identified above have led to epistemological crisis for many believers. Now, don't let that word scare you. That word is dealing with, epistemology is dealing with the branch of philosophy that, that seeks to determine truth. Okay? So they are saying, when he talks about an epistemological crisis, look at the quote. He says, if the early church was a theological quagmire, if the apocryphal books are as valid as so-called as so canonical books, and if scholars are convinced the New Testament is filled with forgeries, then on what possible basis can Christians have confidence that they have the right 27 books? How can Christians even know such a thing? So this is, if you encounter an atheist or somebody who is hostile toward Christianity, this is the line of reasoning that they are going to be putting forth in front of you, okay? And I have even noticed, uh, maybe not personally, but through, uh, can I... Talk about your encounter with the gentleman. I won't mention his name, but um, Craig has shared with me an encounter he had with somebody who, who said, I'm reading the Apocrypha. Okay? Um, I don't know what his motivation was for that, but it's becoming more and more of a, of a, of a thing, even within Protestant circles, for people to be paying more attention to the Apocrypha. Okay? And a lot of that is coming from these, these critical uh, notions of things. Okay? It is in answering these questions that we find the central thesis of Kruger's book. He says, quote, the volume, This volume is concerned with the narrow question of whether Christians have a rational basis, i.e., intellectually sufficient grounds for asserting, for, excuse me, for affirming that only these 27 books rightly belong in the New Testament canon. Or put differently, is the Christian belief in the canon justified or warranted? All right. Now, I'm already going to tell you my answer. Yes. All right. Yes, it is. And we're going to be looking at that, though, over time. My goal, though, in doing this is to, is to go through and have you understand the different positions that are out there on this in case you happen to encounter somebody who is believing one of these, one of these things. Okay. So really, the idea is, our, when we affirm that we accept the 27 books of the New Testament as canonical and authoritative, 
Are, do we have any rational basis? Do we have sufficient grounds for believing that? Are we justified in believing that? Do we have any warranting that would suggest that that would be a reasonable thing to believe? Okay. Now, Kruger is quick to point out the circumscribed limitations of his thesis by discussing the difference between de facto and de jure objections to the concept of canonicity. Now this is, this is important here, okay, um, to understand the difference between these things. So if you go to top page three, there's an explanation of what he means by de facto objections versus de jure objections to canonicity. So let's start at the top. De facto. This objection argues that Christian belief in the canon is intellectually unacceptable on the grounds that it is a false belief. Okay? So it starts off with the premise that canonicity is what? False. false. Okay? De facto objections are quite common in modern canonical studies and have taken a variety of forms. For example, these books cannot be from God because they contradict each other. You ever run into somebody that says that? Well, this, these, these, this can't be from God. These books contradict each other. I run into that a lot. Um, here's another one. I think that should say or because, not of because. Or because they are for... So let me read that sentence over again. For example, these books cannot be from God because they contradict each other or because they are forgeries or because they are merely the choice of the winners or early theological battles. All of those would be de facto. You can't trust it because of this, 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 or this. Okay? The winners decided it. They're, they're full of disagreements. They're not really from God. Never mind the fact that the Scriptures internally tell you in 2 Timothy 2.15 that you need to do what with the Scripture? Study. Study it and rightly divide it. Okay? But they'll just look at the surface of that Regardless of the specific form of the de facto objection, the overall claim is the same. The Christian's belief in the canon should be rejected because it isn't true. And they will give you any number of reasons for why you should reject it along these lines. It contradicts itself. They're forgeries. They're the choice of the winners. All of those would be de facto objections. Okay? De jure objections are different. Okay? They're different altogether. The de jure objection argues not so much that Christian belief in the canon is false, but that Christians have no rational basis for thinking they could ever know such a thing in the first place. So that is a much more sort of potent attack. Okay? It's, it's going right to the heart of whether or not you have any justification for even believing in the idea of a canon. The de facto looks, goes out over here and it says, well, it contradicts itself. It was the winner's point of view. It was this, it was this, it was this. That's de facto. De jour is going straight to the matter of, is there any rational justification for you believing in the idea of a canon at all? Okay, very different sort of approach. <coughs> They'll say, <coughs> excuse me, given the chaos of early Christianity and the various disagreements over books, not to mention scholarly claims that some of these books are synonymous. How do you say this? Pseudonymous. That means not written by the people that they say they were. It would be irrational for Christians to claim that they know these 27 books are the right one. Or, excuse me, the right ones. So, this is, this is saying, basically... That if you believe in the canon, and if you believe in the idea that the 27 books that are currently constituted in the New Testament are the exact 27 books that should be there, okay, what's your rational basis for believing that, and are you irrational for doing that, is basically where they are coming from. Okay? How do you know that these are the right 27? Thus, on the de jure objection, the problem with... The Christian belief in canon is something other than its truth or falsehood, but has to do, and this is important, but has to do with whether Christians have adequate grounds for holding such a belief. So Ernie, when you go out there and you say, I believe the 27 books of the New Testament are the, the exact 27 we should have, these people are going to want to say, well, what's your, 
how do you know that you have rational belief and foundation for accepting those 27? Okay, And they're not going to bring up that it contradicts itself. They're not going to bring up any of that stuff, probably. They're going to bring up how do you, what's your rational basis for even believing this idea at all? That's a de jure objection. Okay? Now, I understand that when we talk using terms like de facto and de jure, I risk losing some folks. But I'm trying to explain that simply so that you understand the difference between those two things. Does anybody have any questions about that? So our goal in discussing canonicity as part of this class is more de jure in nature. So I'm more concerned with the de jure objection than I am the de facto objections. Okay? It's more de jure in nature. Rather than discussing our knowledge of the canon or proving the truth of the canon, our aim is to account for knowledge of the canon. Okay? Put another way, does, does, should say, does the Christian faith provide sufficient grounds for thinking that Christians can know which books belong in the canon and which do not? So, put, another way of saying that is, do the scriptures themselves teach you to think that there would be the idea of a canon? Okay? Is the idea of a canon inherent to the Bible's own claims about itself, right? Now think about what we've seen so far. Does the Bible teach its own inspiration? Yes. Does the Bible teach its own preservation? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now you can't find the word canon in the Bible, okay? You can't find the word rapture in the Bible either. You can't find the word trinity in the Bible, but do we believe in that the Bible affirms those concepts? Okay, so when we get to the issue of canonicity, what we're looking at, does the Bible teach you to think that, you, that there would be a canon and a collection of books that the church would view as authoritative, which would therefore exclude other books? Okay, now we kind of talked about that very in a preliminary way last Sunday when we, I introduced you to this concept, and we will be coming back to some of those things later on. Okay? Does everybody understand what I'm, what I'm getting at there? It's an important distinction. Okay? So this means that our explanation of the topic, uh, the topic in this case obviously is canonicity, will not be purely historical, but also theological. How, quote, how can the Christian religion account for its knowledge of the canon without talking about the Christian understanding of the way knowledge is acquired? The canon can only, can, the canon can only be rightly understood and defended when both history and theology are taken into account. They should be in a dialogical relationship with each other as allies, not adversaries. So in other words, does the Bible say anything about the issue of canonicity? If it does, do we need to let the Bible inform our understanding of how to look at canonicity? Okay, The same way we did with inspiration, the same way we did with preservation. Okay, So in other words, whatever one believes of the canon, whatever, hmm, we flag that sentence for later. In other words, whatever one believes of the canon needs to be scriptural in its approach. History should be interpreted through the prism of scripture, not the other way around. Amen. Okay? The scripture is the authority that teaches me and establishes the principles that go to allow me to go out into the history and identify what I should be looking for. If the doctrine is true, should I be able to find it in history? If the doctrine of preservation is correct, and preservation occurred in a multiplicity of copies that were available and in use, should I be able to go out into history and find what the doctrine of preservation taught me to look for? Okay. Well, the same thing is true in this in this uh, topic. Okay. So, <laughs> bottom of page three, the approach set forth by Kruger is essentially the same one we utilized when we did the Grace History Project. 
Now, some of you were here when we did that. Some of you weren't. But if you recall back to the... I actually went back and, and looked at all of this stuff again. But what we did is I taught about what the New Testament church was from the Bible, how it was established, the local churches. We went through all that doctrine. And then we took that and we went out and we laid it over the history and made some determinations about what was going on in the history, not solely through the history, but through the prism of what that doctrine taught us to believe and think. Okay? Does that make sense? So that's very similar to what we're going to be doing here and very similar to, to the approach that Kruger takes in his book, The Canon Revisited. Okay? So recall that we first established... So I'm still on that point on the bottom of page 3. We call that we first establish what scriptures said about the church and then judge history through the prism of the scripture, not the other way around. For this reason, I have affinity for Kruger's work. It has the correct presuppositional starting point. The position that he ultimately takes is, if you're going to understand the canon, if you're going to investigate the canon and study the canon, you can't do that unless you are paying attention to what the scriptures themselves say about the canon. Okay? <laughs> so, what is a canonical model? <coughs> According to Kruger, too little attention has been given to understanding overarching canonical models that often determine, should say, one's definition of the canon in the first place. Okay? So your approach is going to have a lot to do with where you come out in the end. <clears throat> Kruger defines a canonical model as follows. He says, quote, A canonical model is just a way of describing a particular canonical system, if you wish, which includes the broader methodological, epistemological, and yes, theological framework for how canon is understood, and most importantly, how canon is authenticated. Everyone who studies the origins of the canon has such a system or process, whether clearly thought out or not, by which he or she distinguishes a canonical book from a non-canonical book. So, if I brought in the Gospel of Thomas and the Epistle of Judas, and I put them up here on the podium, and I said, should these be in the Scripture, you would all say what? No. no. no, right? And then I would say, how do you know? And you might, I don't know what you would say, I'm not asking you, I don't really want to know, but that's what he's getting at here, right? If you're going to say Thomas and Judas shouldn't be there, based on what? How are you, how are you going to answer that question, Right? If you're going to say they should be there, based on what? Okay? So, thus, a, I'm halfway through that quote. Thus, a canonical model is not to be equated simply with one's historical conclusions about when and how these books became authoritative, but instead it describes the broader method methodological approach that led to those conclusions. It is not just a date of canonicity or even its definition, but the grounds of canonicity. How does one go about determining which book or which set of books belongs in the canon? A canonical model is then one's canonical worldview. So, for example, if I am a Roman Catholic, there is an entire Roman Catholic model for determining what should be in the canon, and it's the magisterium. We'll study this next Sunday. It's the magisterium. It's the tradition of the church. The church determined what was canonical and what wasn't. Okay? So when Protestantism breaks away from Roman Catholicism, one of the first things that they argued about was the Apocrypha. What, 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 what should we view the Apocrypha as? And interestingly enough, the, the Roman Catholic Church never officially affirmed the Apocrypha as Scripture until the Council of Trent in the 1500s because of the Protestant Reformation. Okay, but my point is, if I'm a Roman Catholic, I'm going to have I'm going to have a canonical model that I'm using to determine what the boundaries of the canon should be. If I'm a Protestant, I'm going to have a different canonical model that I'm going to use to determine what the boundaries of the canon should be. Okay, and then you've got all sorts of people. Now I'm using two easily delineated examples by talking about Catholicism and Protestantism, but even then you get into some really weird stuff about how this should be done and what the framework of it should be. So what we will be looking for 
or sorry, what we will be looking at in coming lessons is not simply a choice <coughs> between historical positions, early or late dates on the canon, but a choice between canonical models or overarching systems <coughs> or approaches for how to approach the question of canonicity. <coughs> various models will be, uh, will, the various models will not be uh, categorized on the basis of a date or definition as is commonly done, but on the method employed in authenticating the canon or on what grounds does one consider a book to be canonical. Stated differently, on what grounds do we know that, do we know that a book belongs or does not belong in the New Testament? Okay. <coughs> so this is a different approach even than what I took to the, this topic when we did the Grace History Project some years ago. So please note, that, please note that categorizing models in this manner on the basis of how they authenticate books might group authors together who disagree on the particulars uh, such as the definition and date of the canon. So we're not, we don't, we're not looking here at, well, this guy says the canon was finalized in 1350, and this guy said the canon was finalized in 1406, and this guy said the canon was finalized in 1509, or 300 AD, or whatever. I'm just being arbitrary here. I'm just pulling numbers, right? Or, well, this guy said it should be these 24 books, and that guy over there said it should be these 26 books, and these two guys over here said 29, and then we got these guys here that said 27, and that's, that's what we ended up with. That's not what we're doing, okay? We're looking at what is the process that they're using to determine whatever they ultimately arrive at as what the canon should be. Okay? So there is a summary then. The last point for this lesson is a summary of the three different canonical models. Okay? So Krieger outlines, well before we get into this, does anybody have any questions or comments about the, the second or the third point? Second point being I'm sorry, the point about how what the canonical model is. Anybody have any questions about that? <clears throat> All right, now let's look at the summary then. Okay. Kruger outlines three different models for determining the borders for determining the borders of the canon. These models include the following. The first, the community determined model. This model holds that the canon is determined by its reception or recognition by individuals or the church. Okay? So, hey, listen, if I don't really like the book of Revelation, and the book of Revelation doesn't speak to me, then I don't have to accept the book of Revelation as canonical. Or if I don't like the book of James, or if I don't like the book of Ephesians, or then I don't have, and it doesn't speak to me, and it doesn't move my meter, then I don't have to accept that book as canonical. Okay? This is a real view. It's called the neo-orthodox existential view. But it's basically saying that an individual or a community determines what the canon is. All right. If you look at the quote underneath that, as a general description, community-determined approaches view the canon as something that is in some sense established or constituted by the people. Okay? Or, excuse me, either individually or corporately. So the Roman Catholic Church would be an example of a community-determined model. It would be this institution determined what it would be. Okay? A neo-Orthodox view would, would be it's still a community-determined model, but it's not, it's not determined by an organization. It's determined by each individual. So that means we could all have different canons based upon whatever we find to be helpful or speaking to us. Okay? So... Let me start that again. As a general description, community-determined approaches view the canon as something that is in some sense established or constituted by the people, either individually or corporately, now watch, who have received these books as Scripture. 
Canonicity is not viewed as something inherent to any set of books, but as something officially or authoritatively imposed upon certain literature. So the reason why we have 27 books in the New Testament is not because there's anything inherent about those books that makes them authoritative. It's because the community decided they were. Okay, Community determined model. Thus, now watch, thus canon does not exist until there is some sort of response from the community. Simply put, it is the result of actions and or experiences of Christians. So, you know, if your experience is different than mine and you don't like Romans, and I do, well then, maybe Romans isn't canonical for you. But it is for me. And maybe I do like the epistle of Judas, and maybe I like the gospel of Thomas, and I think those really should be. And I, and I also like, you know, Second Edoras and the book of Judith. I think those should also be in. And, you know, if you, you're free to disagree with that if you want, based upon personalized existential philosophy of whatever speaks to you, well, then we'll just roll with that. Right? That, that is a view that is out there on this. And this first model is essentially saying that it's going to categorize any view that says canon does not exist until an individual or a community pronounces it to exist. So the authority is not with the scripture themselves. The authority is with either the individual or whoever this group is that's going to make this determination. Okay. Then the second model <coughs> is the historically determined model. And this maintains that if, histori that if historical investigations can demonstrate that a book possessed apostolic content or authority, it should be regarded as canonical. Okay? <coughs> These models deny that the Christian community's reception of the canon is definitive in establishing its authority, and instead, and instead seek to establish it by critically investigating the historical merits of each of the canonical books. If a book can be shown to contain authentic Jesus tradition, or can be shown to be apostolic, then it is considered part of the genuine canon of, canon of Scripture. Specific examples of the historically determined model Models reach very different conclusions, ranging from the rejection of most of the 27 books, the canon within the canon model, to the acceptance of all 27 books, criteria of canonicity model, but the methodology is the same. Canon is authenticated via the investigation, historical investigation, into these books. So one view is going to say what we need to do is we need to find the, the original gospel within all the mess of the New Testament. We need to find the original gospel and we just need to, that is the only thing that is canon. That's the canon within the canon view. Because we cannot historically substantiate parts of it, so therefore we need to not accept that as canon. That's basically what they're saying. Okay, And then we have... Thirdly, the self-authenticating model. This model holds that the scriptures authenticated themselves in the hearts and minds of believers when they were written. Okay? So when Paul sends Romans to the church at Rome, when he sends Galatians to the churches of Galatia, they read those things and they receive them as what? They receive them as the Word of God. They receive them as Scripture. Okay, And the, uh, the authority is inherent to the books themselves. And that they could authenticate themselves in the hearts and minds of believers as believers read, studied, and interacted with those books. Okay, Which means then that the New Testament is going to have to be experiencing a wide-ranging copying process from very early in its existence. Because that's how this is going to work itself out. Okay, A self-authenticating model of canon would take into account something that the other models have largely overlooked. The content of the canon itself. Rather than looking only at its reception, community determined, 
or only to its origins, historically determined, this model would, in a sense, let the canon have its own, excuse me, let the canon have a voice in its own authentication. So, this view says, this view doesn't say that the canon was something that was done to these books. This view would say that the canon is something that the scriptures testified of themselves. Okay? And we kind of already went over some of that. Remember last week we talked about how there were false letters as from Paul circulating. We looked at how Paul himself even wrote other things that didn't end up making it into the canon. Okay? So the self-authenticating model holds that or allows the canon to have its own voice in its own authentication. All right? So if you haven't figured it out yet, the one that I am in favor of is the self-authenticating model, the model that gives the scripture its own voice and its own authentication in establishing what is scripture from what is not scripture. Amen. Okay? Now there's very interesting things to consider about that that I had not ever thought about until I started reading some of the things that this gentleman says in his book about it. Okay? So I'm, I'm, I'm real... I'm excited to get to some of that, but before we do that, we're going to spend one week, well, let me finish the lesson here. In the coming lessons, we will be exploring all three of these models in greater detail in order to establish a firm grasp on how we can have confidence in our present collection of 27 New Testament books. Okay, I'm going to do one lesson summarizing the um, community determined model. That's what we're going to do next week. I'm going to do one lesson summarizing the historically determined model, and then I'm going to present to you the self-authenticating model, and we'll probably spend a few lessons understanding how that works and explaining why that is the correct model that you want to view, or want to, the, the correct approach, excuse me, that you want to take for thinking through the issue and the question of canonicity. Okay? So, does anybody have any questions or comments about any of that? Fred and then Craig. Okay, the, the phrase that has kept going through my mind as you've gone, because this is pretty new stuff to me, uh, about all this, these objections and so forth, is, uh, goes back to Genesis chapter 3. Satan, in his approach to Eve, said, Hath God really said? In other words, it's a satanic. Uh, attack on the authority of God's word. And the adversary will spare no expense or any while <clears throat> on doing that. So if he can't get you with the idea of, I've got to reconstruct the original, God didn't preserve his word, maybe he can get you with, well, how do you really know that there's even a canon at all? And all this, you know, critical stuff about, you know, you can't really know and all of that. So I agree. It's, it's the adversary has false thinking that has been put in place to trip somebody up at any place in this whole process right. if we're not careful which is why we need to have an, an authority outside of ourselves that we can go by as a guide for thinking through these things because otherwise we end up with just the pronouncement of either some person or some organization mm -hmm. okay Craig I'm like Fred I'm just I'm thinking of Genesis 3, uh, where Scripture says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. And the community-driven model seems like there's, um, there's evidence of that when you go to a church, if anybody here has been to a church that preaches out of different uh, modern translations, you'll hear a pastor say things like, well, this... This translation says it this way, but I like the way it says it in, in this one. So there's a, a tendency to lean more towards a, um, a particular translation, and it puts that it puts that person as, in my opinion, that they're now the authority over which you know. Well, this is the Bible that I prefer because I like the way that this one, you know, phrases it or words it. Yeah, that kind of stuff happens all the time. I'll be listening to something and. The guy wants to make this point, so he uses this version. And then he goes and makes the second point, but he uses this version, and then uses a third one to make the third point, because those are the ones that he can use to establish the points he's trying to make. Yeah. So he's becoming 
in a sense, his own authority, his own delineator of, of, of not just what he believes, but the various authorities that he's using to establish it. I don't know if that makes sense, but I do understand what you're saying uh, along those lines. Was, was there anything else? I mean, was there more to your comment, I guess, was my question. No, I think that's, I think that's it. Okay. Did adding, you? Um, adding to Craig's comment, uh, the, that book that was hugely popular a while back, The Purpose Driven Life, it was chock full of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He would just go into whatever translation was uh, uh, propped up his, his view and use that, you know, totally out of context. What a mess. So the point is, we want to have basis, right? We want to have, we want to we want to have reason for reasons for why we think what we think, and they are there. But any reason that that ignores this as a testimony for how we should think about these matters to me is not a good one. Okay. The same thing I'm going to argue when we get to it. The same thing with translation. Romans sixteen twenty five and twenty six. And this is where I have to say that I'm not sure I'm with all of my uh, all all the folks that might agree with me about the King James. But look at what this verse says, verse 25. Now to him there's a power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the promise or prophets, excuse me, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all what. Nations for the obedience of faith. <clears throat> well, wait a minute. Does God want all nations to know the revelation of the mystery? If God wants all nations to know the revelation of the mystery, then is God's word telling me that it's going to have to be translated into the languages of the nations? So therefore, they can know what? The revelation of the mystery. They can know what God's doing. So there, there has to be, if, if I believe that verse, then that verse ought to influence how I think also about the issue of the translation issue. Okay? Because we can talk about inspiration. We can talk about preservation. We can talk about can canonicity and making sure we know we have the right 27 books in our New Testament. We can talk about its transmission through time. But part of that transmission through time is going to be the issue of it being translated into the languages of the nations because any, any, member of the, any believing member of the body of Christ that's acting by faith on Romans 16.26 is going to have the idea, I better do what with this? I might have to translate this so that all the nations can know what God's doing today through the revelation committed to the Apostle Paul. That, that's a huge deal. So even in that issue, we need to let the Scriptures influence and speak to us about how we think about the matter. Okay? But now we've pretty much gotten through the whole time. I've gotten through all of the notes. Did anybody have a question? So, next Sunday, we're going to be talking about the community determined model, specifically. Okay? So the point of this lesson was to introduce these. Alright? I guess we're done if nobody has a question. Alright, thanks for your time.